Hi everyone, we have Anxiety from Cosmos today and we will talk uh, in the preparation for the mainnet launch which is going to be happening very soon, Zaki will tell more. Yep. We will be discussing um, the, the protocol and we're going to go into a lot of very deep technical details, so super excited yep. to, uh, to have you here. And uh, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, I am, my name is Zaki. Uh, I've been sort of contributing to the Cosmos project for almost two years. Um, I right now work on sort of research and development and sort of new opportunities for, for Tendermint. And I'll be ta explaining a lot of stuff that probably has not been well communicated before, but we're probably is like probably one of our biggest goals over the next couple of months is to uh, really start communicating some of these higher level concepts in the protocol about how the blockchains composed together. Cool. Awesome. And uh, to start off, can you outline like a very high level overview of what Cosmos is and yeah. what is the goal of it? So the goal of Cosmos is to achieve sort of scalability in uh, decentralized finance, um, sort of secure computation through a network of communicating blockchains. So you have many blockchains, but one ecosystem. So what we are launching the mainnet of in January is what we call the hub. And the hub is a very simple blockchain. Um, it's designed to just do, be basically proof of stake consensus. And then it's designed to keep uh, account balances for zones. So zone A, And so the basic concept of the initial vision of Cosmos, though I think we're going to get deeper into, is each of these are a blockchain. And those blockchains exchange data packets to, with each other. Um, and if those data packets contain a token or an asset, um, the hub will say, OK, there are you no know, 100 CBTC on zone B. There are 10 CBTC. And if the packet says, if zone A says send a CBTC to zone B, it goes, it, uh, uh, goes like this, and this becomes 99, this becomes 11. And then the proof of that state transition being sent to zone B allows you to have one more CBTC. And CBTC is uh, sort Cosmos of the Cosmos B. version of Bitcoin? Well, it's like the pegged to the hub Makes security sense. model version of Bitcoin or something like that. Yep. Okay, so that's the basic vision of what Cosmos is. And most of what the two last two years have been about is both making the consensus engine robust enough to operate with a bunch of strangers op running the nodes. Um, no BFT system in the history of the world has ever been operated like this before. And then the second piece was getting the proof of stake model correct so that it was not trivial to manipulate uh, for like things like, even in the uh, context of a BFT system, you still, if you have uh, sort of large cartels, um, you exist in a world where there are various kinds of griefing attacks, et cetera, on the incentive layer, and no one has ever built an incentivized BFT system before. So that's the other piece that we built. Um, and then the, the sort of third piece to the full vision is completing uh, the the state transfer between zones. Makes sense. And so since it's proof of stake, there is some native token. <laughs> there is. Okay. <clears throat> that only exists on the hub, or it also exists in Every the zone? zone will have its own native token in mm -hmm. the cu current design. Right. Um, there is, we have a, we have, we see a need for potentially a single token to secure multiple uh, blockchains, but that is not the common case. That is the uh, sort of specialized, there are certain circumstances where this makes sense. Case. Right. But there's a special token specifically for hub. Yes, those are called the atoms. Another thing to remember to, to know is there's not like one hub in the Cosmos network. Mm. There are going to be other hubs. There's one called Iris that already exists and is going to be launching sort of in parallel with the mainnet, but we anticipate there will be one. I see, so there's no centralized hub. There is no centralized I hub. See. And so if I want to do a say if I want to send some token from zone A 
to some zone which is not attached to the same hub, it's gonna have multiple hops effectively. Yep. Makes sense. <coughs> cool. Uh, and so one question is, the, the entire idea is that the zones are expected to be somewhat different blockchains. So yeah. what would be a use case when they would want to launch a blockchain and not just an application on an existing blockchain? So one of the th so one of the things that we've sort of fundamentally questioned in Cosmos is the notion that there should that there is like one common pool of security that many applications make sense to draw on. Um, it makes you know part of the sort of crypto economic model that we're that is that where we are challenging the orthodoxy is the idea that unrelated applications that are not part of sort of a, a common ecosystem that share common incentives actually make any sense to host on a single blockchain. Um, in a world where BFT consensus and BFT computation is scarce, then you only have, let's say, the Ethereum blockchain, and the Ethereum blockchain is your only BFT computation resource, so then you want to host all of your applications on it. But the idea of demonstrating that BFT proof of stake actually works removes this fundamental limitation around scarcity. Um, as long as there are people who are willing to operate a blockchain and are willing to put enough skin in the game to convince an ecosystem that they are incentivized to securely operate that blockchain, then it makes sense to have, like, it, will, it makes sense to have many blockchains. Makes sense. And so, <clears throat> Another question is for so for CBTC. Yeah. At some point, for CBTC to appear in Zone A, it needs to be locked on the Bitcoin network. Right? Yeah. Is it Zone A that recognizes the fact that it was locked on Bitcoin, or is it the hub? The hub that. Uh, it's the hub that recognizes. Hub. It. Okay. And like that designation of what is so there could be like there could there in all, in all likelihood will be many pegged Bitcoins in the hub. There could there will be you know Bitcoin peg one Bitcoin peg two Bitcoin peg three but there's likely to be sort of one Bitcoin peg in this ecosystem that the majority of the social consensus and the largest amount of locked up collateral um, is securing and that is likely to be what most zones then treat as equivalent to a Bitcoin. makes sense but there's no there's no let's say single zone that is dis that is there to to sort of represent Bitcoin in the in the in the system no. Like creating zones is a permissionless thing. Mm -hmm. Creating zones okay. is a permissionless thing. Creating hubs is likely not as permissionless. It probably needs more uh, assent on both sides, um, simply because um, if you connect to a hub and that hub fails, um, and we haven't talked about how everything, like how do you actually represent state moving back and forth between chains? You, you've just sort of hand waved it at this point. But this is the fundamental question is what happened, like if you have a BTC peg zone and that BTC peg zone is compromised, uh, all of the, you know, all the collateral, all the Bitcoin that's stored on the Bitcoin blockchain for that zone suddenly is stolen. Um, what happens to all of it? How do you reason about this? Um, and the sort of core design of Cosmos is how do you actually think about this problem? Uh, and making it so that the n ecosystem as a whole uh, can uh, understand, comprehend, read how a security failure of one zone affects the whole ecosystem. Makes sense. And um, how, however, there's another project called Ethermint, right? Is Ethermint part of the, is it a separate project? Is it? Okay, so here's what, here is what the notion of Ethermint is basically there to, it actually is there to solve three problems in our ecosystem, or three challenges in our ecosystem. One is, so what it based, Ethermint is the EVM as a Cosmo, as a module in our SDK. There is really no requirement on these zones that they be written with our software. Um, any fast finality BFT consensus layer will work as the consensus for a zone or even a central, I mean, it, even a centralized database would theoretically work um, and would potentially work. Um, and the, um, and like you can run any state machine that you'd like. 
Um, but what we've what we think is a great tool, so we've built this Cosmos SDK to make building hubs and zones easy. Um, and the one of the tools that we want to put in the SDK tool chat uh, is the EVM SDK module. The EVM SDK module gets a couple of things for us. It allows you to what we call hard, it basically allows you to read EVMs, like uh, read Ethereum state. So you have some blockchain that ha has some state in it that you want to use, like a token distribution. Having the EVM as a module in the SDK allows you to build a blockchain that starts with that state and then does something interesting with it. So mm -hmm. this is what we call, the, what we typically call a hard spit. Um, the second thing it says is it lets you use EVM software. So if you take an ecosystem like 0x, for instance, as I've said, it doesn't. we don't think it makes any sense to run all every different application that is running on Ethereum on one blockchain. But there is an ecosystem of applications that exist around things like uh, Augur or 0x. It might make, it would make sense for all of those things to coexist on one blockchain. Um, and so what having um, the EVM as an SDK module would let a developer do is reuse the software from, an, from a, an integrated interoperable ecosystem that exists on Ethereum inside of the Cosmos ecosystem and benefit from that. Right, and is there a plan to have a zone which starts as a, as a, like a point in time fork of Ethereum? So we are not, so we have this notion that we are not, uh, uh, there are no definitive plans for this because we are going to leave this question up to um, the, the governance signaling mechanism on the hub as to what we actually do. Um, but one of the challenges that we have in the Cosmos ecosystem is that there is no native store of value medium of exchange to the Cosmos ecosystem. Um, atoms are intended to be highly illiquid um, and to the extent that other staking tokens exist in the Cosmos ecosystem, which we expect there to be many, um, we expect them to also be highly liquid. We think that is the optimal design for a staking token. Um, so we have three strategic initiatives that we are pursuing um, to help the ecosystem develop a medium of exchange and a store of value. And one of those ideas is that we would grab the state of Ethereum run it as a zone so you would have this new zone down here called that is like it has the ethereum jam first this is just a hypothetical date it could be any date ever um uh ethereum account state um and but the intent is not to run this as a fork of ethereum forever because we think this makes no sense what our, our point of view is, is that the ether that is represented in this state can flow back into the hub as photons. And to the extent that Ethereum is a store of value and a medium of exchange that people use, which is it is in today's world, um, we think that there might be a shelling point around treating photons, which are a mapping of that state into Cosmos, as a medium of exchange and a store of value. Makes sense. But then... Eventually this <clears throat> dies. Mm -hmm. Like, the hub validators run this for six months and then turn it off. Okay, makes sense. But, so let's say after Gen 1st it forks out and then someone someone who sold his Ethereum immediately on the Ethereum chain could mm -hmm. still use it as photons, right? Yes. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, and then... <coughs> okay, so... Uh, you probably, when you want to do this, want to pick a past state rather than a future state when you are deciding. But this is, again, a decision that is up to the hub validator government. Makes sense. It is also a crazy experiment, and no one knows if it will work. But in essence, anyone can launch a zone which is snapshot of Ethereum. Yes. Any, yeah. Then another question is, when I was in Prague, there was a lot of people working there saying, I'm a Cosmos validator. 
Yes. Right. So they participating in the test net, right? Yes. But ultimately, as a Cosmos validator in the, on the main net. Yes. Am I someone who is operating the hub, or am I someone who is also operating some zones? So, being a Cosmos validator is simply the expertise to run the software for any part of this ecosystem. And for a zone or hub to be successful, they must come up with a crypto economic model under which the validators who operate the software receive enough compensation that they want to operate this thing. So we have a crypto economic model for our validators in the hub, which we think makes sense. Um, and we think there's a, a clear value proposition for why you would want to be on a validator on the hub. Um, every zone will have to discover their own economic model that leads there to be validators on it. Otherwise, no one would ever send their money to your zone because they would be like, who is running it? And they can do arbitrary bad things to me. Makes sense. And then in the, in the bright future of Cosmos, what do you think is going to be the number of zones? Thousands. Thousands. And then validators, are they expected to run like clusters of expensive hardware and operate multiple zones? Or do you expect a single Cosmos validator to be operating like one or few zones? We expect that, so my perception is, and I've been working on you know, creating this validator community for over a year. And there's maybe 200 people who operate validators credibly in the world right now. Um, if we are going to have thousands of zones, which I think there is a market for, and we only have hundreds of validator operators with credibility, this implies that most of those validator operators will be running many, many zones uh, to secure them. Um, there is probably some future in which the population of validator operators expands dramatically, but I think that future is is more is like at least five to ten years away. Makes sense. <clears throat> Uh, and so the consensus that is run on every, especially uh, at least on the hub is Tendermint. Right? It's Tendermint. But it is not a requirement for zones to run Tendermint. Yes, but it is by far the easiest thing to do to just run Tendermint on your zone. Makes sense. And in the hub, when we run Tendermint, so as of today, nobody ever ran BFT in any sufficiently popular blockchain. Right? Yes. So at this point, for, for example, we don't know how likely it is that more than one third of people will go offline, for example. Sure. Right, so but we do have data because we do have a year of running test nets um, where, uh, you know, the, the one third going offline is within some window of time because if you are offline, if you are individually offline, we unbond you and remove you from the validator set without. So it's not like, so the question has always been given a, a removal time on the order of a, of, of a day or, or a week. Um, we've been typically running with about a day of removal time. Will people sort of fall off the network and the network halt? Um, and what we've been, I've been really pleased to see, because in the test net, everybody who's running on our test net is basically just like burning money. Mm -hmm. Like I've burnt a lot of money on our, of my own money on this, these test nets. People have, all, everybody in our community has burned money and no one has any incentive to like be like rigorously monitoring, have full-time employees, like, when pager duty goes off because your nodes are down, like immediately respond to it. And so the question is, would we have sustained liveness on these networks? And we have had essentially almost nine months of sustained liveness moving from testnet to testnet on these networks, which gives me an enormous amount of confidence that the hub will actually stay up. Right. And what, what was, they have a statistic in terms of how, what, what was the largest percentage that was simultaneously offline? I don't have data on that. Mm -hmm. I could probably, we'd probably like go through records and figure it out, but we haven't been keeping data on it. I mean, mostly what, mostly what we would have noticed, it, we, would, we notice halts. Um, and we have definitely had periods of time where like all the validators are like, where we're like close to halting and a bunch of validators are like yelling in, at each other in chat rooms or texting each other being like, dude, you got to bring your validator back online. Um, but it, it has been fascinating that like, this is a truly decentralized system. The test net that's running right now is a 35, have, have, has 35, 135 validators on it. We don't run any of them. Um, they organize the entire process themselves. Um, this is the... And so today with 135 validators, there's no sampling, right? So Tendermint is, is run by all the validators. Yes. And are validators known in advance? Uh, no. 
how but tendermint doesn't tendermint depend on knowing how many people are participating. So there's a bonding process in which you add a new validator to set. So there's some initial validator set that starts the network. Um, and so basically our process for starting a network is we have an account state. People submit bonding transactions, which are signatures under those account state. Um, and then Tendermint processes that into a, the initial validators. And then, uh, you know, two thirds plus one must upgrade to the new software, run the thing, and then we have all of this. Makes sense. And uh, so for bonding transaction to get through, the, the present set of validators needs to approve it, right? Yes. Do they have any incentive not to do so? Um, so censorship is probably the most interesting thing to think about at this stage of the maturity of the system. Like what is going, like, like block proposal censorship, um, uh, pre-commit censorship. These are all things that we have thought a lot about. Now you need two thirds plus one of the network, or you need one third of the network to be colluding in order for censorship to occur. And no one has really ever tested this. And like, how do networks be behave under the presence of, uh, of censorship? This is the purpose of Game of Stakes. Mm -hmm. Game of Stakes is a test of what does censorship look like on a live network. Makes sense. And so here, so the bonding transaction <coughs> needs to be included into the block, right? Yep. So effectively, if the first block producer, if the current block producer wants to censor it, they can pr propose a block without the... Yeah. Transaction, but then the next block producer also needs to exclude it. Needs uh, also needs to exclude it, or you can have a cabal of two thirds of one third plus one that is like a cartel of one third plus one that is watching all of the block proposals and essentially rejects any block proposal mm -hmm. that doesn't meet their Makes needs. Makes sense. I see. Makes sense. But then, so these attacks exist. But if you have more than one third plus one, you have bigger problems, right? Look. Uh, my 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 que what I think is cool about Tendermint is the and has like turned out to be one of the most valuable things and I really credit Jay for for doing this is one of the things that Jay focused on in the design of Tendermint is that actions are attributable. Um, you there's always a signature associated with the decision on the network. So and an absence of a signature in the in the case of, uh, uh, of, of sort of non-vote. Um, so putting together the evidence of censorship and like detecting censorship is possible in this system. And ultimately what we believe blockchains are for is they are for automating social consensus. So if there is censorship on a network, social consensus has broken down about what that network is supposed to be doing. Um, and then the question is, how do we resolve that? And I think over the next week, we're going to see this in real life um, because I, I'm in game of stakes. We're currently aware of people planning censorship attacks. We're, we're aware of people planning forks to respond to those censorship attacks. And I think what we're going to see is what this actually looks like playing out in real life, which where, by which censorship occurs on the network and then the social, and then people attribute that that censorship is occurring. They show you the block proposals that have failed, um, the signatures on those block proposals, um, and that uh, and, and pre-votes and pre-commits to those block proposals that have failed. And that gives people enough information to detect the failure of the social consensus on the network and move to a new social consensus. Makes sense. And so as an example of that, so let's say that there's a cartel of one third plus one. Yes. That want to censor out a specific bonding transaction. Yes. Right. So and so at some point there's a block proposal with that transaction and yes. none of them signed it. Yes. There is no. It feels to me that there's no evidence that they actually did not sign it. Right. The absence of a signature is not the. But you do have the signatures of everybody who was not part of the cartel. Right. But but could it be that it's the everybody else who censors the signatures from the cartel to 
for example, to in, to intentionally slash them for uh, um, for colluding. I am. I think that these these questions about how people convince each other who is at fault are going to be super interesting and ultimately rise to the level of a social process. Um, and there will be some and like there will be like when there is disagreement about this but what we will have is we will have a signed block proposal and signatures on that block proposal at the time from the time and people will be able to go in and say okay this is but like this is the grand experiment um this is the experimental thing about running bft consensus if it works and it actually can't and people and at a social level when these kinds of censorship events occur people can um, can eventually come to some sort of consensus about whether or not censorship occurred. This will be, but we. What I'm skeptical of is automating this. Mm -hmm. Also, there's no automatic slashing for. for um, there is acting. There is automatic. There is a small automatic slash for downtime, and in game of stakes, we are experimenting with all of this stuff being a lot easier to do than it is in the normal world. So in Game of Stakes, you know, you don't have to put down capital to join the network. You just had to sign up. So if you get all your friends to join to be part of your cartel, you join Game of Stakes, you have a, a large cartel in Game of Stakes. And the same way um, for uh, you also, uh, we are also tuning the, the, the slashing parameters so that censoring people and getting them slashed is a lot more effective on Game of Stakes than it would be in the real world because we I want because we want to see these attacks and we want to start understanding what do they actually look mm. like and you're saying there's no so let's say there's no automatic slashing for uh for not signing a block yep is there then some sort of manual way to slash those people later or they will be just punished through the rework and, and losing their ability i to mean participate the new social consensus that spawns some new blockchain um that is you know hub prime um, can instantiate those accounts of everyone however they want. It's ultimately, like, the fundamental question of whether or not uninitial starting state of a blockchain has legitimacy comes down to whether or not the operators and the wider economy perceive those people as legitimate. Makes sense. And so, okay, starting in your social consensus is a hard fork. Yeah. Makes sense. <clears throat> and uh, in the hub, how, how often are the blocks created? Um, so we have been running with a five second delay um, on block creation um, for, uh, for basically the reason was back at the beginning of the year, we, we did not have a five second delay on block creation. Um, and this resulted in the blockchain growing very large, very quickly. Um, and so we, so right now, uh, I was just looking at the numbers on our test net. For 135 validators, we have 6.5 second blocks, and we have a five second delay in there. So it seems like one to two seconds on mainnet for a blockchain is for for Tendermint running with a global a global validator set seems to be plausible. Makes sense. But ten Tendermint itself, if you remember how Tendermint works, the the time that it allocates for pre vote and for pre commit is hard coded, right? It, it the the timeout section is a parameter on the. Uh, on oh, but if if the pre vote happens before the timeout, um, uh, then then it goes to pre commit without waiting until it, the time is over. I'm, it actually waits till the end of the timeout. I see. And yeah. and how long is timeout? There, I have to look at what we're doing right now. But is it on the order of like a second or? It's a, like five hundred milliseconds. Five hundred milliseconds. I yeah. see. And uh, so that means that within five hundred milliseconds the. So after pre-votes, there's 500 milliseconds for pre-commit, right? Yeah. So if valid, let's say validators are spread out around the world. Yeah. Is, isn't the latency between, let's say, China and United States, like if latency is around 300 milliseconds, they would not be able to So to do the pre-commit, right? To be completely honest, this is not a thing that we have fully empirically understood exactly what's going on. Um, the goal of Tendermint has never, at this stage in its maturity, has never been transaction throughput. Like, like transaction throughput metrics are things that, like, 
there are multiple constant factor improvements over current Tendermint that are achievable. Like you can uh, make a pre-vote on block n plus one a pre-commit on block n. Um, like there are, uh, so, so that would take out a significant amount of, of latency in the system. Um, what we are mo uh, we are what we are mostly observing is on the system setups that our validators have chosen to run so far. Um, uh, this set of parameters it is working well, um, um, and the parameters are are not in consensus even. So people can adjust them, and they're like just what they end up being a sort of an emergent property of what the operators choose to run. So if the operators, you know, if the operators want to like sort of pull down these parameters and have a more geographically concentrated hub, they can do that. If they want to increase the parameters and have a larger validator set and a more geographically dispersed hub, they can also do that. This is just sort of essentially, these are like emergent uh, constraint free parameters. But like, there's also an enormous amount of engineering work that we have not done, which is just like make tendermint fast. I see. Um, our goal has like for this phase has been make tendermint robust enough that a bunch of people who are not who you know are basically professional or hobbyist validators but not necessarily like distributed systems engineers can actually operate this thing with strangers over the internet i see awesome and then i guess from here we can move to the most exciting part the ibc yep so ibc my understanding of ibc is that's a way to move yeah let's get can you can I have the yeah Let's, let's erase all of that. So IBC is the way to move assets between zones, right? Yep. <clears throat> and so from perspective of, uh, of a hub, yep. so the hub doesn't care what sort of consensus the, the zone is running. It does need to be able to submit a light client proof of that consensus to I the see. hub that the hub is able to understand. And, uh, and can people deploy sort of custom code oh. into to the hub for validating? So in theory, yes. In MVP, no. Makes uh, sense. Um, like apparently Polkadot plans to do this. Um, I think that is a great idea. I don't think it is a, a kind of thing that anyone should deploy to a blockchain in like the next year. Makes sense. Um, like, like, I do like, Infinite flexibility and the ability to like jump and like jumping between protocol code and uh, uh, between like the code that's in the runtime and the code that's provided on chain are just make the complexity of these systems like greater. And we have so little experience and knowledge running these systems that like we prioritize simplicity. So if there was if somebody else, like right now, the only BFT protocol that meets our needs that even exists in the world is Tendermint. So it's like, what are we building to? But like in the event that someone builds something else that is good, um, like that would be a thing that would be pr a, probably a great idea. Like I think the uh, progress. So like, what are the what are the components of IBC? So one is like client proofs. It must be efficient given some root of trust, like so you need some root of trust and an efficient way of getting to current state, to prove current state. Okay, so like hypothetical blockchain will be snapshotting the latest blocks to the hub. So usually when you send an IBC packet, you send, so in Tendermint for instance, because Tendermint has a very efficient like client proof system you send the blocks that, sh uh, so you send the blocks that prove validator transition. So there's some number of blocks that are, depending on how dynamic the validator set was, that are that show that the validator set transitioned. And then the current block height, and then a Merkle proof of your IBC pack. I see, and so for as long as two thirds of validators are honest. Yep. Like that proof could not be, and there's, there's two thirds of signatures effectively. Yes. On that. And if they're dishonest, submitting evidence of conflicting blocks in the, at this block height would terminate the connection. Mm -hmm. But then they still, if, 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 the, if the zone is corrupted, 
Yep. What can they still effectively do is they can completely fabricate the state, right? Yes. And then send the proof. But, that, yes. but that's sort of a risk that the destination zone is taking, right? So, so, so if you, if you. Okay. So like, let's. Um, can I have the eraser again? Let's, this, this comes down to like sort of the core set of di of like understandings of of how given a system like this how does tr like how it how do you reason about corruption okay so you have some hub let us assume for the sake of argument that the hub is not corruptible like that corrupting the hub is hard mm -hmm. um, this is the 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 route the reason for that assumption is the sort sort of core reason why hubs are a scarce resource. If they're corrupted, they affect the the integrity of a very large ecosystem, and therefore they so everybody has an incentive to run full nodes who are participating in the ecosystem. There are many parties, and this is why forks and heart and upgrade should be rare. Um, but so you have and then you have zone. So you have let's say so. Let's say this is evil zone. Or actually, no. This is a good zone. So the question has been, so the sort of fundamental question here is, so, Evil zone is doing evil things. There, they could withhold blocks. They could fabricate, fabricate state transitions. And the good zone does none of these things, and the hub does it. And uh, uh, the, the evil zone sends evil crypto kitties. from the evil zone to the hub to the good zone. And the good zone is like a dex of, and people exchange their cats for money. So the whole point of, of Cosmos is, is that when you see an evil cat on an evil zone, it's actually labeled as what was the origin? And then what is the asset name? And all of the honest participants in the protocol will maintain this relationship. So when you see this, the good zone, anyone who's exchanging the good zone is going to be evil cat. We'll see evil cat from evil zone. And, you know, they will also see, like, good zone's liquidity token. So you have good zones liquidity token, and people are exchanging evil cats for good zones liquidity token. Our expectation is, is that if you're withholding blocks and you're fabricating state transitions, essentially, eventually the market will be like, why is there this blockchain where no one can get the blocks, and why, um, you know, no one really trusts these zone operators. Who are they? And no one can run a full node. Like I tried to run a full node. And the information that the evil zone is evil will be socialized, and everyone who is a counterparty of things under the evil navel sp namespace will eventually be like, will be like, I will value these things as zero. Right. But by that time, someone might have lost an evil cat, right? Sure. So, yeah. Okay. Or someone could have lost some some like, you know, good zone liquid tokens in exchange for evil cat. Um. And the um, you know, if if uh, uh, you know, there is a possibility that the good zone could upgrade their state to try and make these people whole, um, you know, or it could not. It would probably be easier just not to, because this is a blockchain and terrible things can happen. Right. What my whole reason why I think this is an acceptable design of a system is because let's say that instead of having good zone and a hub and an evil zone. This was all one giant state machine and had exactly the same security properties as everyone else. 
The reason why I think this is fundamentally a, an acceptable design is this set of reasoning where you have to reason about the state machine that originated your asset is still there as long as that state machine can be upgraded or has an admin or like really as long as there are any of the hooks that like fundamentally are necessary for software as we currently build it to like sustain itself over time, you still have to think about is the state machine that originated my asset and every asset has some level of risk associated with it, which is that the state machine that manages it could be corrupted. Right. So I have two questions here. Yes. The first one, so in this example with the evil cat, yep. let's say that evil cat did not originate in the evil zone, let's say that it originated in, in on Ethereum. Yeah. In like so, there was original Crypto Kitty. Yep. And then there's some sort of way uh, to uh, to lock it on Ethereum. Yep. It appears on the hub. It went to the e someone on the. So Evil let's let's button. say so like an ETH cat now originates, comes in. Okay. So ETH cat goes into the hub. The ETH cat then goes to it gets tra tra goes to Evil Zone. So now you have like an ETH cat on this on this zone. Now, what can Evil Zone do with this ETH cat? It can steal it from its owner. It can be like, no, this is ours, or we transferred it to anyone we want, because it they have arbitrary control over the state machine. Um, they can, um, so that's the main thing that they could do. They could go offline. So like, my ETH cat is now frozen in this zone that has died. Um, but what they can't do, as long as the hub is honest, is is make two ETH cats. Right. So effectively, whomever is that person or that entity on Evil Zone that purchased the ETH cat, that, that was their responsibility to assess the security of, of the Evil Chain. So if you, if you are using Evil Zone, you should have some opinion about the security of Evil makes Zone. Sense. Yeah, that makes sense. And so the second question is, it feels to me that the, the the so if let's say I'm trusting either Ethereum, so let's say Ethereum and Cosmos have the same security from my perspective. Sure. The, the Cosmos Hub, for instance. Yes. But this particular zone has different security. Less, less security, right? So then, if my kit is on Ethereum, it feels to me that I only need to be uh, accounting for the risks of Ethereum chain being corrupted. Yes. Or or Ethereum uh, hard forking and yes. accepting a fork which contradicts my personal values yep. as, as the one, yes. right? Which for many of us happened in the past. Um, then wh while in Cosmos, it feels like I also need to be accounting for the fact that a small- A smaller a, like set a, a of small operators- Has colluded. Has colluded right. and has become evil. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. <clears throat> so- What is your, so like, in the absence of a notion of cost, that seems like a negative trade-off. But one imagines that in all like my right, sort of back of the envelope calculations, like sort of rough guesses, is that computation in the more even the ones that are relatively well trusted, like even if you if you move your crypt, crypt well, you want to trade your crypto kitty on Ethereum, you're going to be paying tens or hundreds of thousands of gas for to use a dex. Um, you're going to um, uh, uh, you're gonna you're gonna be uh, confirmation times will be you know on the order of minutes uh, if not longer um, and that will be the status quo and when you are on cosmos you will be uh, you know with today's software getting you know one to two second absolute finality times your gas costs will be at least a thousand times cheaper like you will you will be so this is why Ultimately, this crypto economic model competes against the the Ethereum crypto economic model, and then the question will be, where it you know for what set of users is the decrease of cost? Because right now, what you have on 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 Ethereum is you have two choices. You have choice A, which is I can run on very expensive, very, very difficult to corrupt software on Ethereum. Or I can go to a completely centralized system in which the admin of that system has arbitrary control. What Cosmos is basically building is a middle ground. 
um, where there are validators. Those validators can harm you. Um, and that validator pool is not enormous. It is not completely infeasible to corrupt, but it is difficult to corrupt. Um, and your costs are much cheaper. Makes sense. <clears throat> And I've one seen. imagines that there will be, you know, there will be zones with more validators, there will be zones with more, you know, more state. And so, and potentially in those zones with gas prices will be higher. Mm -hmm. And so when you're saying that gas price is going to be a thousand times cheaper, yep. is it coming from the fact that there are many zones or from the fact that there's no, the cost is lower because you're not, you don't need car hardware to, to compute hashes? Um, there are two reasons. Um, one is simply there is less, like, the gas costs on Ethereum must pay for like Ethereum, like Ethereum gas costs are in a competitive marketplace where this zone ecosystem is a competitive marketplace for gas, where people are looking, are, where the market is trying to choose between security and cost and is continuously pricing these things. Um, and so if your zone is charging more than the market will bear for security, a competing zone will show up and compete with you. Um, and the market will have to judge this. Um, and like one of the things that is like a fundamental question, but like once you have BFT consensus that can be run in a public setting, I think emerges naturally is whether or not the market can price security accurately. And it may take five years, it may take 10 years for markets to like, and there will be horrible disasters of, of zone takeovers um, in that meantime. But my thesis is, is that this, architecture is is in some sense natural and as long as bft exists it, this architecture will exist too um and the market will eventually find an equilibrium of understanding how to price censorship resistance and security versus the value of the computation makes sense and uh another question i have is so you mentioned that today majority of the validators they have some sort of a slack or discord channel where yeah. they no, well, I mean, there are many channels. I see. There, there's the the validator community has like a right. Like one of the reasons why we have to ensure censorship and resistance and integrity around the hub. If we just said like this is the blessed Slack that all validators, then the admin on that Slack would essentially be running the hub. Um, we would be running the hub, and obviously we've wanted to like avoid this case as much as possible. So we've. It's, thoughtfully encouraged the validators to have many channels by which they communicate and many channels in which they form social consensus um, and that we don't manage that social consensus in any real way. Makes sense. But then if there's exist a channel where more than 50% of validators are, well, they, they're there, yep. then doesn't that create an opportunity for someone to use social engineering now where they would convince all of them to do something Neg absolutely negative, such as like hard forking into something absolutely okay. it is definitely a risk um and this is why being an operator of any of these bft systems that we're building is f what requires a sort of operational security mindset sort of deep suspicion about the world like deep suspicion about what you're seeing and it has been very interesting seeing that evolve um over the time like We've definitely seen social engineering attacks in these channels before, like we will see them again. Like, yes, as long as validators are communicating with each other, those communication channels are exploitable. Our main form of resilience to, is to encourage as many of them as possible. But yes, uh, this is a, like, what we are creating with the main launch of our mainnet and with, with, with Game of Stake is a bit of a, like, uh, of a Hunger game style, uh, uh, competition in the world of who can run systems like this in a trustworthy manner. Um, and, you know, I think that the, the tr you know, the, the practice of the last year of running these systems and test nets is enormously valuable, and we're, but we're going to see where does this come from. In, in many ways of like the last 10 years of operating a cryptocurrency exchange has have tested like many of the same, have like produced a population of people who have the operational security chops to have hotkeys on the internet. Um, in the same way, uh, uh, this in, uh, uh, world of validators that is being constructed is, going, is creating a world of specialists who have the skills to operate a system where you are running BFT consensus and you have the consensus keys live on the internet. 
Awesome, makes sense. Okay, so that was all the questions I had about Cosmos. Okay. Uh, anything important we didn't cover? cover? Um, I guess the main. I well, like I said, the, I think the main thing that is going to be. Um, really important for for the Cosmos team, for Tendermint, for us to communicate to the world is how to think about this model. Ultimately, the world is not going to think or care very much about the low-level proof format. But the world, every user of Cosmos is going to have to have a, a mental model of what does it mean when I see evil zone slash evil kitty or good zone liquid token you know in another zone um and one of the fundamental questions and like we are clearly in a very immature uh place of being able to reason about that i think we're even when you look at like exchanges operating on ethereum contracts how much auditing of an erc20 contract do they do before they list it many not that much um and you know many of these erc20 contracts have admins in them that can arbitrarily mutate state and um, you know, I think exchange operators are just in the very beginning of monitoring that. Um, and so if you're an exchange or any other economic entity on this network, you know, when you are, when you are, you know, receiving tokens, you are going to have to have some way of reasoning about is the hub that I'm connected to, um, uh, trustworthy and secure. And like, are these validators that are staked into this actually operating the system in the same way? Um, if I accept, if I start being a, 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 an economic entity, whether I'm a, a retail business or an ex, or a cryptocurrency exchange or anything else that sort of starts to emerge in this ecosystem, um, and I start accepting tokens that originate from GoodZone, do I believe that, do I run a full node on GoodZone? You better run a full node on GoodZone. Um, in fact, if you are an economic entity and you are a counterparty to any of these things, you should be running a full node of everything you are a counterparty to. Makes sense. And uh, the very last question is, so you're saying that a lot of that is, at least at the early days, is going to be more of an experiment. So is Cosmos going to be updating frequently in the early days? At yes. Um, or what I'm hoping is, is the system that we've laid out can be more or less in place by the sort of middle to like by Q2 of 2019. Then hopefully at that point, we can leave the hub alone and do most of the innovation in like, we can have like, okay, we have the hub and the hub is reasonably stable, but we like hard spoon every, all the atom distributions into crazy experiments at hub and crazy experiment hub we do, we upgrade it like, you know, all the goddamn time. And it's like more or less a glorified test net that it's interconnected to the hub. It's like one step removed from test nets. Uh, and this is where we try all the crazy new ideas, like, like mutable objects that can be transmitted between zones instead of just simple things like crypto kitties, uh, like alternative event formats so that you can implement like other more complex business flows. Like there's lots to, there's lots of experimentation and the whole, point of Cosmos and the reason I've been like I've been working on this for like essentially the last three years is that right now when you want to experiment with a blockchain like like we've all seen the cycle of like new technology being deployed on Ethereum is it's like new technology idea is invented code is written six months of politics happen maybe a hard fork that upgrades that protocol. This is like, we are never going to get to a system that the global economy can work on using that as the way of doing things. What we need is the ability to launch new blockchains, have them handle real assets in small amounts, see if they work, see if these if new ideas make any sense, if they work at scale, if, any, if the economy has any appetite for them, and then move them up the ecosystem into the hubs. Um, and so I guess what I'm really excited about is once you have these primitives, it unlocks the building box to build everything else. It basically, it makes it very easy. Like if you are, are playing around with like actually getting the shared security thing done, you plug into this ecosystem very easily and very early. Like any beacon chain design plugs into this system trivially. 
um, and you can just interoperate with it trivially, and it's very easy, and you can get to play with all of your technology. Um, and so you can incrementally deploy pieces of sharding within the security model. Like there's, there's lots of innovation that finally gets unlocked once you have these pieces and they work. Cool. Okay, awesome. So thanks a lot for uh, My pleasure. coming.